Welcome into the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young with you from K State Online as we start off this, you know, getting close to the final weeks of college football here. Uh, three games left on the regular season schedule for K State. And uh, we start this Monday recapping their tough overtime loss to Texas, 33 to 30, the final score. DY, you were there in Austin. And I'm sure that uh, sitting there, you thought at one point, man, this is a, a wasted game. And then you also were probably thinking after Ben Sennett caught that ball in overtime that this is going to be one heck of a K-State win. Uh, neither of those things were true. K-State just ended up losing a tight game in overtime. Uh, so give us some of your immediate thoughts. And I guess you've had a little bit of time to, to dissect everything and, and maybe have a little bit more of a thorough thought process than some did immediately after the game. Yeah, uh, that was a tough way to lose. So I can imagine emotions were running high and, Everything was pretty raw afterwards uh, for the players, too. I mean, you could tell that some of them are kind of affected by, by what had transpired. And it was a culture game in terms of the way that they were able to fight back and make that a contest when I thought they were going to have the doors blown off of them, quite frankly, as you alluded to. And and then, obviously, you feel like you probably are going to win once Ben Sinnott makes that catch and it's first and goal at the six. So I guess for starters, I think it was the right decision to go for it. You got out schemed and out coached on that fourth down call. To be fair, the prior three plays all could have been touchdowns. So um, it is what it is on that front. You, you feel like you had a win ripped out of your hands, but at the same time, you did a lot of self-inflicted errors as well whether it's, you know, the drive at the end of the first half that goes and does nothing for you because you're not able to get him to field goal position. And obviously you didn't run out of bounds when you could have. You, you turned it over twice. Once was, what, inside the five-yard line and Texas scores on the very next play. Yeah. So those are, you know, the mistakes that they'll, they'll, they're going to want to have back. But I guess when, you know, I get to my takeaways now, you call Colin Klein is probably still feeling himself out a little bit when it comes to being an offensive coordinator. You got to remember he hasn't done this for very long. And he has a trend that's typically the opposite of what you you do you typically see, where you know sometimes offensive coordinators abandon the game plan too too quickly or abandon the running game too quickly. And I think sometimes we've seen in, in his short Stin as an offensive coordinator, he might stick with it too long. Now we say that they still have a chance to win the game at the end, but how does that look like if they kind of abandon that initial game plan and, and go to the passing stuff a little sooner, like Will Howard said they probably should have done? I mean, that's a fair statement. Another fair statement is, you know, the Malik Murphy is really what helped Kansas State out quite a bit too. Mm-hmm. Now that that doesn't mean Kansas State had. Um, doesn't still have to take advantage of it. They still do, but he helped them a lot. And I and someone fought back on me for the statement, and they were correct in doing so because I was like, you know, at the end of the day, Kansas State just went and took a team uh, that's going to make the play, could make the playoff down to the wire in overtime and in their own building. And their rebuttal, and it was a fair one that I've – given some oxygen to is is this real this isn't really the playoff version of texas though like if texas had to have malik murphy at quarterback for a full season they go what eight and four maybe so maybe nine and three so you, you got to take all those things into account and at the end of the day it's a golden opportunity that was missed but you have to analyze both sides of it they did a hell, hell of a job to even get into position to have a chance to win the game. It is it is fair. I mean, this is certainly – Malik Murphy made some serious errors, and there are some things that hold him back from being uh, – getting Texas to the level that they would be to be that, that possible playoff team that they'll be under consideration as. I will say this, though. I mean, I think because of the 
the cachet and thought that was put around Quinn Ewers uh, in his recruiting process and and how much attention he gets and everything else. I think the the mythical status of Quinn Ewers' talent is built up to a much higher level than what it actually is. And we saw that last year in the game in Manhattan where Texas was giving the ball to B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. It was going just fine. And then for some reason, they started letting Quinn Ewers to try and make more plays, and Texas didn't do much in the second half. So, I and look, Quinn Ewers is better than Malik Murphy, and Malik Murphy made some serious mistakes that helped K-State out in that game. That is true. Um, but, I mean, the K-State defense played well in some stretches there and also, like, the fumble, and that wasn't a Malik Murphy problem that happened in the game. And we can look at it and say, I mean, K-State, offensively, the turnovers that they had, um, number one, the, the interception was kind of a, a fluky thing and unfortunate and everything else. So everything considered that we can point at and say, man, this favored K-State or this didn't, I think at the end of the day, the outcome is probably what the outcome should have been. Texas is probably a team that with all of that talent and everything else is a better football team than K-State. And when they play in Austin and K-State is on the road facing that type of team, it's not the most shocking result that they lost. I mean, K-State, I I think that there is a serious argument to be had that even despite this loss, that K-State – could be under consideration is still the second best team in the big 12 behind Texas. I think right now you'd probably give it to Oklahoma state just because they've been so good over the last, what five games. Now they've won five straight games in the big 12, but it's not out of the question to, to give K state that tag. And I, I think that at the end of the day, the outcome is what the outcome probably should have been. We just got there in a very roundabout way for K state. And it sucks that it, it happened like that. Sucks that they weren't able to pull it off because they very easily could have and should have won that game. Um, I saw somebody pushing back about the, you know, saying that they should have won that game. Prior to the game kicking off, I would not have said K-State should win this game. But when you have four plays from the six-yard line to try and win the game in overtime, that is a game where you probably should have won it. You know, the, the opportunity was at least there, and it's not asinine to suggest that you should have won that game. And Fortunately for K-State, they came up short, and some of the things that have plagued them all season or in that game reared their ugly head. I mean, K-State has struggled in short yardage situations when they get deep into opponent territory. You know, the third and one on the the drive that Chris Tennant ends up missing the kick. I mean, K-State doesn't have many options there. I, I probably would have liked to have seen them throw the football uh, because – they have not been able to be successful with the the quarterback run game, at least the quarterback sneak or that draw was very predictable uh, in those situations this year. And then getting down deeper into the red zone and, and being inside the opponent's you know ten yard line, uh, they've had struggles scoring there. And then the offensive line, you know, kind of kind of botched a couple things on a few of those plays, and the offensive line didn't have a very good day for K State. So just it, it's unfortunate the way it works out and everybody's going to look at it and say, man, you spotted Texas, all these points and everything. Uh, But K-State made the comeback. They had the opportunity and they just didn't take it. And that's probably the outcome that was uh, ultimately destined to happen uh, regardless on if they had just traded blow for blow to start the game, or if it was teams making big charges early and late. Yeah. And what the interesting part is they really didn't switch things up that much on the defensive side of the ball from the first quarter either. Like the game plan stayed the same. Yeah. The the schemes for the most part stayed the same. Maybe a little tweak in coverage here and there, but for four quarters, they said we're going to force Malik Murphy to beat us. The difference wasn't Kansas State doing anything different from the first quarter to the other three. The difference was Malik Murphy said, Okay, I will go beat you in the first quarter. And then one thing went wrong and he went real sideways. So yeah. It wasn't like Kansas State came out with a terrible play and it didn't work. I mean, their plan that worked for three quarters was the same one that didn't for the first quarter. Sometimes guys are going to emerge and, you know, make plays, and then sometimes they will, you know, return to form and be the guy that you expected them to be. You know, another way to look at this, too, is – and this is kind of glass half empty, so – you know, a little bit of a negative no, spin here. I think there's a lot of people out there that will like that take then. A lot of people, I think, yeah. want, want to be glass half empty right now. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's true. But it, it, I guess it's going to be more twisting the knife than anything. 
is if you had told me before the game that Texas was going to turn it over three times and Kansas State was going to block a punt and Kansas State was going to have three receivers, not running backs, not tight ends, three receivers have at least 69 receiving yards and Will Howard was going to throw for almost 400 yards and four touchdowns, I think Kansas State wins that game. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of outcomes that would suggest that K-State uh, would normally win that game, but it was just kind of an odd one, and uh, Texas was able to, to just jump out early, and, and that, that really changes things. So and, and Errors of their own, right? You, yep. you have two turnovers of your own. One is a catastrophic one inside your own five-yard line, or the Longhorns score in the next play. You, you come up empty there at the end of the first half on that drive because Ben said it doesn't get out of bounds and, and – not able to get another playoff because of it. I'm um, trying to think here. Chris Tennant missed, you know, missed a chip shot field, field goal. goal. There's the extra point issue with, where you can't say for sure that those things are going to have a huge impact on the game or on the outcome because Texas also treats everything differently had yeah. those gone through as well. Their yeah. strategy on defense changes. Their strategy on offense changes. Like, for instance – if it's a tie game or, or whatever, you know, I, I guess I'm not saying Texas wouldn't just run the ball three times and putt and be okay with that. Yeah. Yes. No, I, that that's the thing. I mean, there are a lot of things and, and we just don't really know, but there were enough mistakes in the game where you feel like if K-State eliminates two of them, then the outcome is probably different. And most of the mistakes that K-State made in the game seem fairly easily avoidable. I mean, they're just – they're things that we haven't seen for most of the year. Like early on, we were worried about Chris Tennant again, but all those fears had kind of gone by the wayside. And then all of a sudden, when you need him most, it doesn't happen. But he he picks himself the back up. Fault. Yeah, and the yeah. extra point's not his fault. And that's one of the – I mean, I can't tell you the last time that we saw something like that happen at K-State. I mean, it feels like – you probably haven't seen anything like that happen since you've been covering K-State in the last six years. There might have been something in 18 just because that year was kind of a, yeah, that was a bad a, team. Yeah. That was a bad team, a bit of a mess. It just didn't look like Jack Bloomer was ready for a snap. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. It wasn't, it wasn't great and uh, was just kind of indicative and, of, of K State's day. And it made it worse is that they actually made it like 10 seconds before that, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The exactly. Penalty. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It was a good penalty by Texas. So they knew what they were doing there. Uh, all right, well, let's uh, finish recapping the game with Texas. Tough loss for K-State with going through our over-unders. Uh, I have some bad news for you, D.Y. Uh, his, you, have, you have company at the top now. Uh, I had a big enough week that we are tied again, uh, so we, uh, we are going back and forth. Uh, the first one was K-State points per drive, 2.7. You and I both took the under here. Drew took the over. Uh, the Cats ended up being under that almost by a full point. I think it was like 1.76 uh, is what wow. the, the points per drive numbers were. So K-State struggled there, and that, you know, it makes sense given uh, how the game started and how many empty possessions there were early. Um, I mean, what what did you make of the K-State offense from the standpoint of a lot of people are thinking, why didn't you abandon the run sooner? And you already hit on it some with, with Colin Klein. Maybe he digs his heels in too much to the game plan, which certainly pays off in some games and in others, it, it absolutely does not. And uh, give, give the takeaway there on the K-State offense against Texas. Yeah. The game kind of play would have played out like I thought it would had they been able to run the ball even a little bit. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. man, they have to establish the run game. They have to establish the running game. Kansas state thought the same thing. They just never could. Probably stuck with it a little too long, but I didn't think that they could throw without the threat of a run game, and they proved me wrong there. Yeah, I, it's just one of those deals where uh, it, I thinking about how K-State went into that game, like we all thought they needed to run the football successfully, and they weren't able to. I mean, indicative of that, like I'll just throw this out here real quick. Treshawn Ward car or carries, was it 10 and a half, I think is what Drew said that. Uh, we all ended up taking the over on that. And both running backs, they got nine touches each out of the backfield in the game. So 18 total carries for your running backs for K-State. And I'd have to dig to see just exactly how many of those came in the second half, but I doubt it was very many. 
So no. um, the, the the in the carries in the second half might have been QB run. Yes, uh, you're probably right on on how that ended up working out. I guess I did look at it uh, the the other day and and when we were talking and seeing. So K State ran the ball. They had 12 rush attempts in the uh, second half. Now let's see. One of those would have been a would have been a sack. So really, just eleven rush attempts, um, and it won't break down necessarily easily enough for me to figure out which ones were running backs and not. But I mean, a handful of them were Will Howard or something trying to get figured out. So it was not the game we anticipated. Texas's defensive line was just able to kind of manhandle K State up front, and uh, there was there was nowhere to go for Giddens or Ward or Howard and Johnson when they had their opportunities in there. I mean, how how much of the struggles running the ball on Saturday were because of the the inability of the offensive line or just predictability of Colin Klein's play calling? Because I think that's the third and one that leads to the missed field goal. I think everybody sitting on their couch that, that watches K-State on a regular basis was like, I know what's coming here. And, I mean, it felt very similar to, to Texas in 2021 when you knew exactly what Courtney Messingham was going to do. Um, so was it on Colin Klein or the offensive line for the lack of run game on Saturday? I didn't really like the third and one call, of course. Um, then never felt like I had a chance. But, you know, you, you run against stack boxes, that's going to happen. So part of it is the numbers. And part of it is Texas whipped them at the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Is it fair to, to I don't know if criticize is the right word, but question Chris Kleiman on, you know, he's so adamant about going for the win in overtime, but that play on third and one to settle for the field goal felt very much like they were not playing for the win in that moment. They were playing for the, let's get this thing tied up and see what happens from here. It almost feels like if, the mindset is to play for the win, play for the win in that moment too, and put the ball in the air because Will Howard had been good in the game throwing in the second half. Guys were making plays. I, uh, maybe maybe I'm in the minority on thinking that, but it is one of those things that makes me consider his words and then how it translates. Similar, I mean, Jerome Tang last year after K-State lost to TCU in the Big 12 tournament, he keeps talking about you know having – the success in March and having these guys prepared and for the NCAA tournament, it's one of those where you go, well, how can you have these guys prepare for the NCAA tournament? If you're coming in here saying you didn't even have them prepared for the big 12 tournament against TCU. Now look, drum Tang figured it out and did have them prepared for the NCAA tournament. But in that moment, it was fair to, to wonder what he was thinking, what the thought process was. And, and I'm wondering if it's okay to feel that way about Chris Kleiman in this situation. I, I think they're only, uh, response rebuttal to that would be that they just thought that play would work no they were wrong i mean they're, they're, they're <laughs> i the think that'd be that, a really bad answer to give to that question if you said we thought that play would work when i think a lot of people knew that play wasn't going to work well i under i understand but uh they they're going to trust their guys to get a yard it's just yeah. is what it is mm. i i would not have trusted that offensive line to get one rushing yard for me on Saturday. I just, I think it was a, a big blunder. I look, I think a lot of times the, the coaching overreaction that happens is, is uncalled for, or at least uh, above the level that's necessary. But uh, some of the, the considerations that were made and taken on Saturday, uh, they, they definitely were questionable given what had played out, what you've seen and what people tend to know your tendencies are. Uh, other notes offensively uh, for over under, the other n big one that Drew put out there for us was plays over 20 yards. Um, that ended up coming up just shy. Five and a half was the number, and K-State ended up having five of them in the game. They did a pretty good job of making some big plays that mattered, though. I mean, they didn't have a ton over 20, but they had plays of 19, 18, 17, 17, and 16 and 15 also that worked out in the passing game. Uh, to go with, you know, 32 yard touchdown pass to Jace Brown, 26 yard touchdown pass to Phillip Brooks. Uh, guys were making plays in the second half for K State, and it's a real positive step in the, the right direction, especially since the other one that we were going to get to offensively was Will Howard, his yards. 
uh, over 200 and a half passing ends up hitting. Uh, I think that was uh, one of the ones that, that you, you took the under on because you were confident in the run game. And I mean, look, we all thought the run game was going to have to happen, but I still thought that he was going to have to step up. I did not think that it would be to the tune of him throwing for over 300 yards for the first time. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on where the K-State offense goes from here based off of what we saw big plays from receivers and Will Howard continuing to kind of get back to the level we saw last season? Yeah, I miss all notes just because I didn't think the passing game would be a central part of the offense against Texas. Clearly, it was. Look, I, I made some remarks about what Texas is with Malik Murphy, but their defense is good. So you have to hope or, you know, that, that silver lining you take from this kind of performance is that maybe the Kansas State offense can become a more complete one moving forward. Yeah, no, that's I, I, I agree with that. And look, I think – they, they played pretty well offensively, even considering the fact that I thought it was a pretty negative day for the offensive line. Everyone else stepped up where they could. Obviously, the running backs, their performance is tied in a little bit tighter with the offensive line. But the, the quarterbacks, the receivers, they stepped up in this game, and there's at least positives moving forward. I mean, you, you talked about glass half full, half empty earlier. On Sunday's show with Fan and Drew, like, Normally, I'm not the most like glass half full type guy, but I, I see a lot of things that there was to like about what happened on Saturday, and it gets me excited to see what the last four games of the year could look like for K-State offensively because I think that there's a chance that we're, we are nearing the point where the meshing of, of the run and pass is going to be at its peak for K-State, and I mean – the best way to do it would be to, to torch Baylor both ways, but we're really not going to find that answer out until two weeks from now when we're in Lawrence to see K-State and KU play. But I, I am excited about where the K-State offense sits at this point in time, so we'll see. Uh, the other one that we uh, had on over-unders that we haven't talked about yet, Austin Moore tackles for a loss, one and a half. You were brave here. You took the over on Austin Moore. Um, K-State only ends up in the game – with three tackles for loss, they come from Brendan Mott, Des Purnell, and Jake Clifton. I thought Jake Clifton's was probably uh, the most important and impactful in the game. He came through there and made a really nice play. Um, so you don't necessarily have to speak specifically about Austin Moore, but as a whole, what did you make of the K-State defensive performance on Saturday? Once again, I think the Texas won the line of scrimmage there. but yeah, the defensive line was non-existent. But the defense still – did enough to win that game. I mean, yeah, them holding on for dear life and getting the stops they did, especially late in the game, was significant. It was, it's kind of the same story for the other couple of losses where the defense does some things that are just maddening, makes you want to pull your hair out and, and cuss them out. And then by the end of the game, you're saying they settled down and they did enough and they gave the K-State offense a chance to win the game. And for the first time one. and for the first time this year, it the offense actually took that little sliver the defense gave them and they did something with it. It's just it was too much in the end for them to actually have to do uh, with getting that final score and they weren't able to in overtime. But um, that that's another thing where it just feels like K-State is, is this close with this team and now you have three regular season games left to put it together and obviously – all three are important because if you win out, you're you're nine and three, and then you get a chance for a tenth win, uh, which Drew told us on uh, Sunday's show that K State only has four ten win seasons in their history, um, and the the only time that they did it back to back was 2011 and 2012. So that's what K State would be trying to get to this year if they could win their final four, the three regular season games, and the bowl uh, would be back to back ten win seasons. So. Um, I think it will be interesting to see how it plays out. They didn't, they didn't tackle well, but like you said, did some nice things. They got, they got some guys making plays, mm -hmm. but they don't got dudes making the play right now. Yeah. All their wins are blowouts. They've lost every close game. Yes, and a lot of, a lot of stone hands uh, in the secondary right now. So yeah. we'll we'll see. Maybe one of these days, one of those surefire pick sixes, the Cats will actually get their hands on and keep it in there, and uh, they'll end up in the end zone. But we'll see. 
Uh, that will do it for us for this edition of the KSO Show. Cats lose to Texas 33-30. to Baylor is up next. K-State's a 20.5-point favorite against the Bears, who had a nasty overtime loss of their own. Uh, at home against Houston, the Cougars went for the win, got the two-point conversion, and a big win for, for Dana Holgerson as he continues to carry water for the new schools in the Big 12. Uh, never would have thought that, especially since Houston's not particularly good. So we will see what the Cats and Baylor has in store for us this weekend. We've got more KSO show coming this week on Wednesday and Friday. Uh, and also be on the lookout for everything going on over at On3 with the written stuff, recruiting updates, uh, some visitors going to be in the house this weekend, it would appear, thanks to Drew. And then also uh, plenty going on with basketball coverage as the first two games of basketball season are underway this, fir- I, mean, I guess, first full week of November. So that will do it for Derek Young. I'm Mason Vo. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.